Oh, gee, Rose, and today we're going to be talking about leisure is the test of address. What people do in leisure is how to sense if the people are addressed or only explained away, aided by philosophy as wonder, clearing, waiting, and self-defense. This is going to be talking about Joseph Piper's leisure, the basis of culture. And Mr. Piper will quote Aristotle, who says, and I quote, this is the main question, with what activity one's leisure is filled. What we do in our free time is who we are not what we do to make money, though we often say we're an engineer, we're a doctor, and so on and so forth. And if we have nothing to do in our freedom, we too are, quote-unquote, nothing. Leisure, as Piper means it, is not a state absent of work, though, which is what we might think given how the term leisure is often used to refer to free time after work, a notion that makes it nearly impossible to understand what Aristotle is getting at. Idleness, in the old sense, is really lack of leisure for Piper. There can only be leisure when man is at one with himself, when he is not accord with his own, with when he is in accord with his own being. So the Garden of Eden is a place of leisure, for Adam could walk with God, and thus was at home with himself, but there was work in, the, in Eden. There just wasn't toil. He had to name the animals, he had to take care of the garden, he had to tend to the garden, but he didn't have to toil. And Johannes, at his channel, has talked a lot about Scolé, and Peter Lemberg at the Stoa has also talked about idle, you know, leisure. And idleness and the lack of leisure belong with each other. Leisure is the opposite to both. Leisure is a state of full humanity. Piper's going to talk about the fullness of time. Bruce Alderman with eldership has talked about the fullness of time. Leisure is the correct response to being alone in the room for Kierkegaard and Pascal. Basically, the inability of man to be alone in the world, in, the, in a room, to be alone, to be solitary. Their desperate need for the human to flee solitude into activity meant that there was something wrong with the human being, and that leads to busyness, which is, not, which is really what ends up happening with work when we don't have leisure. Like for Piper, true work, true labor, meaningful labor, is not possible without leisure because labor then takes on the quality of a busyness that is always existentially fleeing from leisure and the self um, and, and the person. Yeah, you're always doing something, and there is something to be said. Well, the issue is now people don't want to waste time. There's an obsession with using time well, and there's two ways to look at wasting time. You waste time when you're not productive, but the deeper understanding that Piper's pointing to is that we waste time when we don't learn to inhabit it, when we cannot inhabit time in its fullest fullness. That's when we waste time. That's when we fail to be fully human. So to waste time, if time is the opportunity to be human, is to dwell in the human, and, to ex and that would in involve um, orienting ourselves to greater truth, greater beauty, and greater, um, greater goodness, as I think the three infinities capture, well then wasting time is failure to use time in service of the infinites. Without leisure, Piper emphasizes, real work is impossible. That is work which makes contact with reality, for leisure is required if the truly human is to be rescued and preserved. Humans are real, and if we are not human, any work we do will prove unreal or that which contributes to making the world less real. Critically, Piper argues that the frenzied need to work, to plan, and to change things is nothing but idleness under other names, moral, intellectual, and emotional idleness. Work is the means of life, leisure the end. Without the end, work is meaningless, a means to a means to a means, and so on forever, like Wall Street or Capitol Hill. Leisure is not the cessation of work, but work of another kind. Work restored to its human meaning as a celebration and a festival, as Piper writes. Feast, festival, and faith lift us from idleness and endow our lives with sense suggesting what is needed for this meaning crisis to be addressed that everyone's talking about. And time might be running out. Intellectual work, you know, the Piper's going to talk about here about the intellectual workers. You know, these terms characterize the, la the latest stretch of the road we have traveled, bringing us at last to the modern ideal of work in its most extreme formulation. Now we work intellectually throughout. Our mind is now given to labor. And if our mind is always busy, then leisure becomes impossible. And, and Piper will draw attention to religious festivals, religious feasts, all these different things that suggest a space in which we can occupy time differently. Maybe the only way we can still connect with this is the holiday. The holiday, Christmas, um, you know, these different Thanksgiving, like these are periods of time in which the world takes on a different quality, a different character. And basically in modern capitalism, the only reference point we have is the holiday, and even that now is commercialized, so we don't occupy time differently. The festival 
was supposed to be this space of occupying time. But we don't have many festivals. We don't have many carnivals. There are some, but not really. And so we just don't have ways to inhabit time. To inta- you can just say inhabit life, if you prefer, in a manner that gives it a different quality. So all we can do is be busy, because we can't be human. From the perspective of the, the, the modern worker that is always biz- busy, leisure can only appear as something totally unforeseen, something completely alien without rhyme or reason, as a synonym, in, as a synonym in fact, for idleness and lady, laziness. And uh, a society incapable of leisure is one where boredom will be everywhere, and boredom is everywhere. Nihilism will be everywhere. Like, leisure is how you fight boredom or meaninglessness. It is the ability to be free. Um, to not be just forced to be, you know, tossed around on the siege of trouble. So if there's no leisure, then there's going to be a meaning crisis. If leisure is required for us to be human, this would mean that we've made the way to be human irrational and, and illogical in modern, co- in modern capitalism, all while we might praise efforts to be human. Um, if all we're talking about is productivity and busyness, then we may, and that, and to be in leisure is to be unproductive and wasteful, then we've made human, what it, we've made what is required to be human impossible, and people will not do it. Um, Piper's going to talk about acidia, A-C-E-D-I-A, which is often translated into sloth as a deadly sin. But you see, we really have to understand what this A word means, and the opposite of it is not the industrious spirit of the daily effort to make a living, but rather the cheerful affirmation by man of his one existence, of the world as a whole, and of God, of love, that is, from which arises that special freshness of action, which would never be confused by anyone with any experience with the narrow activity of the workaholic. So we've come to think that it's a virtue to be a workaholic because a sloth is a sin. But that's not really a good translation of sloth or an understanding of sloth. Sloth is more like nihilism. Sloth, um, what the word, the sin is more like, what's the point? It's more like a sense that life, there's no reason to live. There's no motivation. To lack motivation to live is the sin. But the cure to that is not busyness because you can do meaningless work. The, The cure to that is inhabiting time differently to have a different quality of being. I'm going to talk about intrinsic motivation because I believe basically intrinsic, intrinsic motivation makes life one of leisure. Um, the quality of life becomes very, very different if one is intrinsically motivated. Um, but that's very far from what we think leisure means. We think leisure means not working. It, we think it means consuming, and as a result, we're kind of totally depraved, which means we're incapable of telling that we're depraved. What, though, does it mean to engage in leisure? Don't, don't people have time off after work? Don't people go on vacations? What do we mean that people don't have leisure? Well, Piper's going to make some points that leisure has to start with a philosophical act. Um, a philosophical act is an act in which the workaday world is transcendent, suggesting that philosophy is what makes it possible for us to stand outside of and thus clear ourselves from the world. So there's this point here where leisure is standing outside of the world, standing outside of finitude, standing beyond, sort of, again, the slings and arrows of life. So going on vacation, you can still be thinking in the mode of um, what constitutes productivity and being human according to modern capitalism. Just because you go on vacation, just because you're off after work watching a show, does not mean you've stepped outside the paradigms of the system. So it's interesting to think that leisure requires philosophy, because philosophy is the ability to ask why. And the moment you ask why, you're starting to kind of transcend, you're starting to move beyond. But of course, that means leisure has to start with a very strange and absurd act. Like, it's kind of weird to ask, what is a cup, after you've used it for so many years, right? You've had a cup for years and years and years, and now you're asking, what is a cup? It's kind of absurd. Philosophy, Socrates says that philosophy starts in wonder, and I think that's true, but there's also something about it that's absurd. Philosophy starts with something absurd, and I think that's important, because if we don't get that, then we may wait for wonder, as opposed to maybe taking, dare I say, initiative, although that's a problematic word, um, to begin the entering into the space that makes it possible for us to stand outside the world, and that would be the absurd act of asking why. So I think if you emphasize wonder, you basically are waiting for beauty to disclose itself, for being to disclose itself in a Heideggerian sense, which works, but it also can maybe be possible to take the step ourselves and do something that feels absurd, which is to ask, what is justice? And we see Socrates um, modeling this, and and the paper is going to basically argue that you need Socrates, Heidegger, Buber, and Hume together to engage in leisure. The first would be wonder, so stepping outside of time, stepping outside of just mere mechanical causation. 
to, which is an act of being your own mover. You know, Peter Rollins was saying the only possibility of freedom is to be, you know, you're an unmoved mover, which we can be thanks to lack. But likewise, we can be it because we can ask about a cup, what is a cup? Causation will never make us ask, what is a cup? A cup is in causation, but the moment we ask, what is a cup or what is justice, we're kind of stepping outside of causation and we're becoming our own mover. Well, once we're, we're on once we become our own mover, we can start to move into leisure because the world in basic calls mechanical causation will never move you into leisure, only busyness. So if you want to move into leisure, you have to have a creative cause and effect per se. You have to create. You have to be an unmoved mover. And that's what the philosophical act can do you. And it, and it should be noted, a reason philosophy can, separ us out, can kind of separate us from everyday life is precisely because it is useless. And this also points to the uh, treason of the intellectual, where I spoke with Mr. Hansen about on Benda. And Benda says that colleges basically had failed their duty because they were trying to be useful and thus politically and economically relevant. And that means they could no longer help us be human and thus engage in leisure. And it's just very interesting that philosophy is you know, seemingly the start of of leisure in its uselessness because it is asking questions about the very horizon by which we define use, which is arguably incredibly useful, but it's not useful in the same way as, say, a hammer or a wrench. And basically, without philosophy, leisure becomes impossible because leisure requires a different horizon according to which we define use and practice, and that requires stepping outside of mechanical causation, and that would require the philosophical act of separation from the world with the why question, with the how question, with the abstract questions. Piper is going to say that if you want the sciences to similarly be free and human, history, any literature, any study, it must have a philosophical air to it because without philosophy, things cannot be pulled out of their kind of preset mechanical courses. Um, so this suggests no freedom is possible without philosophy. And if the philosophical act is necessary for leisure, that, that would be because it separates us from the world and thus makes it possible to change our orientation and fittedness to the world beyond capture and the delusion sense, precept assumptions, and so on. And if leisure is a necessary test for address and for us to then experience address meaningfully, and by extension trust is actually there, then we can see why the address of belonging again seems to require absolute knowing, delusion, individualism, Nietzschean children, and the like. So belonging again moves from the explanation to the address. This paper is in the address. And basically, if we want to talk about address, we have to move beyond systems of causation. And that's going to require the philosophical act. And so we can see why belonging again started talking about all these different philosophical modes like in Deleuze, Hegel, Nietzsche, Christianity, and so on and so forth. Because basically the address must require or start with some philosophical mode because philosoph philosophy is what makes possible leisure, and leisure seems to be what's necessary for address. It seems to be the precondition of address. On these points, it would seem that leisure requires a sense of mystery and transcendence, something beyond us, something beyond um, immediate causation that we can dwell on and seek and be curious about and arrive at intrinsic motivation thanks to. Um, it is, is where we see the world as a situation as opposed to a thing, to see the existence of things are kind of idolatry because you believe things are their own grounding, um, as Owen Barfield will talk about. And so leisure seems to require a living along versus living at to allude to that net discussion. Um, and so we need to live along. And you see in that what you have is where you're seeing leisure is not the attitude of one who intervenes but of the one who opens himself, not of someone who seizes but of one who lets go, who lets himself go. Um, and this, I would say, is the absolute knower in Hegel because they accept their limits. So they don't try to um, grab the world. They, they just simply try to honor the world. They acknowledge their limit. I think Zizek is right to emphasize that. And Merold Restfoff is as well. And yet, funny enough, philosophy basically seems to require, um, uh, you know, you cannot ask and think philosophically without allowing the totality of existing things to come into play, as Joseph Piper writes. And yet, that when you face the totality, since you can't ever grasp the totality, all you can live is along it, not at it. You can't grasp it fully. So leisure is a mode of mystery and transcendence. And that makes sense because humans, just as soon as they fully gain something, seem to grow bored with it. So what would have to kind of propel us into a life of intrinsic motivation and leisure would have to be seemingly something transcendent. 
But please note for Piper, the one who philosophizes, does not turn his head in a different direction from the world. When he transcends the work-a-day world in the philosophical act, he does not take his eye off the things of the, of, of the working away. To engage in the act that helps us step, step back from the world is not the same as stepping out of the world. And in fact, the point of stepping back is precisely so that, my, so that we might actually step forward. So the, philosoph the philosophical is in service of the lived. We want to step out of causation to understand how the world operates so that when we step back into the flow, the ebbs and flows of life, we're not just carried uh, into busyness or emptiness, uh, that we actually are engaging in something meaningful. So you have to step back in order to step forward. Um, this paper on leisure will also discuss a bit on deconstructing common life, of the conflict of mind. So we've talked about Socrates, the philosophical act, the wonder, where we step you know, step out of. It's also going to talk about the clearing of Heidegger, where we make a clearing where we're able to reside and let being disclose itself. We're not just carried around by causation. Then we have to engage in an ontological waiting, like Buber talks about, Martin Buber. If we do not, it becomes impossible to have the I-thou that Buber says. Leisure is required for I-thou. Javier Rivera talks a lot about Buber. And then ultimately, we have to self-defend our clearing and our waiting, which is very, very difficult. And that's why you know, philosophy is self-defense. It's where you're defending your life, you're defending your ideas from, you know, being, uh, being swept into t to someone else's idea of what the good life is or the system's idea and so on and so forth. And precisely then philosophy's ability to make everything uncertain is precisely a power that saves us from being controlled because we can always see reasons why the force trying to control us can't ground itself. So, the um, ability of, decon of philosophy to deconstruct them becomes an asset of self-defense. So you need all these things. You need, um, you need the Socrates, the Heidegger, the Buber, and the Hume together in order to create a life of leisure that then maintains that leisure and keeps us safe. So again, to emphasize, although it can be very painful when philosophy makes our own worldview uncertain, the, t the ability of philosophy to create uncertainty is actually very useful in, in terms of self-defense, and this is the point Michelle has made, um, it, it, we can make any sort of claim of how we should live our lives unstable and thus protect ourselves from it. That doesn't mean we never listen to other people, but it does mean we don't let ourselves so easily get swept away. Um, the paper will also talk about the music in Plato, which seems to be the foundation of education without a sense of music, which is how everything goes together. It becomes impossible for Plato to create the wonder needed for us to care to be educated let alone self-educated. That also seems to be part of leisure. Um, we either, the, the paper also references The Good Enough Job uh, by Simon Stolsoff. Uh, Shiva told me about this book. And it's kind of this funny thing where we see in Western societies, as prosperity grows, people work more, not less, which would suggest that people don't know how to engage in leisure, that they're fleeing to work and busyness because they don't know what else to do. They don't have the philosophical act to help them transcend the mechanical causation, pushing them in the directions they're going in. So again, what we see is the, 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 the <clears throat> for me, the philosophical model that relates to leisure is wonder, Socrates stepping back from the world, then clearing within the world, Heidegger, waiting in the clearing, Buber, and then self-defense in Hume. And when we put all these practices in line, then we make ourselves open to the infinite, to the transcendent, the mysterious, and the true beauty and good, which seems to be necessary if we're to engage in leisure. So, and without leisure, we seem to be um, incapable of avoiding capture by the system. Um, I also like, you know, the way that Piper talks about the festival. He says the highest form of affirmation for life is the festival. The holding of a festival means an affirmation of the basic meaning of the world and an agreement with it. And in fact, it means to live out and fulfill one's inclusion in the world in an extraordinary manner, different from the everyday. And again, thank holiday, thank Christmas. Christmas is the most wonderful time of year. People speak about December as if it has a different quality. That's what is being described by the festival. And I think I would associate Nietzsche's child with the ability to make life a festival. To be a child is to live a festival. And I capitalize festival here because it seems to have like an ontological depth to it. And the festival seems to have something to do with absolute communities that are described, uh, communities of absolute knowing with Hegel. And, and also too, Piper wants to stress, leisure is not necessarily easier. You know, philosophy doesn't make life easier, but it makes it fuller.
And that's the key here. Leisure is a state, or scolé, if we use Dr. Niebuhauser's language, is a fullness. And the question becomes the following. This is where the paper will kind of end, pointing ahead. Does all this mean we need a world of decentralized scenes? And Dave at Theory Underground has talked about scenes, scenes, and he did at the Science of Logic conference. But anyway, does all this mean we need a world of decentralized scenes of festivals where children dwell intrinsically motivated and so find freedom in being, which I think aligns with what D.C. Sindler discussed? Yes, I think it does, but now we have to describe what that means. And so belonging again, too, must continue. For more by O.G. Rose, please see ogrose.com, Twitter, Anchor, Instagram, YouTube, so on and so forth. For belonging again, part one and an explanation, please go to Amazon and pick up a copy today. And thank you so much for your time.